Hey everybody, welcome to the Patty G Show. I'm your host, Patty G. We have a stacked house in here tonight. We've got basically the cast of the office in the chairs. Uh, more on that to come. And I'm really excited to have these folks. They drove in from New Orleans, so I'm excited to have some 504 folks down here in the 225 area. The Personnel Consulting Group. That's correct. That right? You pronounced that correctly. Okay, yes. good. Just making sure. Um, and so before we get to that, though, I want to give a big, wonderful shout out and thank you to the amazing folks that bring you this show each and every week. Building 5, Mimosa Handcrafted Jewelry, Falaya Real Estate, Lake Men's Health Center, Horizon Financial Group, Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge, and you know the outfits are always brought to you by McClavey Limited. Without further ado, gentlemen, Michael, Jim, and Toby, welcome to the show, y'all. I'm excited. Thanks, Patty. Thank you, Appreciate it. We're stoked to be here. Good. I, I'm excited to learn about everything that y'all do, how a bunch of financial guys have so much flair and character. There you go. So for those that may not be aware, who are y'all and what the heck do you do? So we are uh, the oldest Louisiana-based um, staffing agency, and uh, we've been around since 1969. Um, I recruit accounting and finance. That's kind of my background. Michael does petrochemical recruitment, so he does engineers in the 1012 corridor. Petrochemical and refinery, yeah. And then uh, Toby does construction. So he deals with a lot of PMs and um, estimators and executives in that uh, scene there. And civil engineering as well as some EPC firms as well. So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, then, and then we have technology recruiters, um, temp contract, um, you know, whole range HR admin. So a little bit of everything. Everybody specializes in their lane. So they get to know the people very well in that arena. So. I like that. It's like not just a recruiting agency with a bunch of recruiters. It's specialized individuals. I mean, y'all got some letters behind your names. Like you've taken some time in your fields associated mm -hmm. to know the field inside and out, not only from a staffing point, but also a workload standpoint. Sure. So how did y'all how, how did y'all get here? Wow. Who wants to go first? Michael was here first. That's yeah. it. That's yeah. 16 Michael. years in the business, and I can't tell you that I thought once about being a recruiter ever in my life, um, but I'm very glad that I did, that I'm here. Started off in commercial real estate uh, right out of college. I, I, I just really wanted to go sell commercial real estate. I, you know, I, I bought my first house in college, rented it out to a bunch of buddies, um, so I enjoyed that type of business. And moved back to New Orleans, uh, started off with Ladder and Bloom, and was doing commercial real estate when Katrina hit. And Perfect time to get started. It was excellent. You know, we had to evacuate, and uh, all I could, you know, see were commercial, not commercials, but video of my office building downtown, where people were, like, breaking into the office to try to get in there and do what they were doing. Um, so I knew my real estate career was going to have to be put on hold. And there's nothing to sell or lease in downtown New Orleans. So I got out of the business and I went into industrial construction sales because I figured it would be pretty hot. We had to rebuild the city. Um, ended up supporting a lot of the chemical plants, the refineries, and then also the general public that needed to come in and buy fasteners, nuts, bolts, all of that. Um, ended up in sales there for about a year and a half and then they asked me to run, um, run a store. So I did that for about a year and, and, you know, based off of commissions there, you had to do really well based off of your previous year. So I knew that I hit a ceiling. And so I called the personnel consulting group to say, all right, what's next? What do you have for me? And they recruited me hard and said, listen, we have, you know, a downstream chemical manufacturing uh, desk here that is not occupied. We'd like for somebody to sit in there and build that business back up again. So I said, I have no idea what this entails, but I'll come in and, and learn about it. And so after about five or six interviews, because that's our president, just loves to interview. Um, <laughs> was, was, was there a lot of people competing for the job? No. I mean, it sounded like an empty, <laughs> it's like an, <laughs> like, I'm, like I'm, I'm they thinking, just I'm thinking it's very it was any good, right? <laughs> it was an empty chair and they needed somebody to sit <laughs> it's there. It's an empty chair. It's five <laughs> rounds of interviews. Yeah. Like, let's really make sure this Michael guy, yeah. you know. Yeah. It's good. Well, it was a family-oriented business. That's right. Okay. And, and it's um, very, yeah, there's there's a lot of that. Like, where we want to make sure before we hire someone that we can trust them with our brand, mm -hmm. with the company, with the, the connections we have, and the conversations and the relationships we have. It, 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 that's It's actually a very serious part yeah. of what we do. As we say all the time, culture is a non-negotiable. That's right. right. So, um, so Frank Loria was the president of the company, and he had been running it for 40 years, I think. Um, and we sat down, you know, lunch. Uh, 
he asked my wife to come sit down. Um, Not actually, in she, the wife? she was actually I was engaged because we got married and I started the day after our honeymoon. Um, so old man, yeah, he wanted to meet everybody. He wanted to meet everybody and just learn about me as a person, and that was great. That was that that was one of the selling points, right? They really he really dug into family and who you are and personality and this place is home, and you just don't see that very often That's right. in the corporate world. So. Um, I said, you know what? Uh, I'm really excited about, you know, basically running my own business from this desk with this computer and this phone um, and building it to whatever I can build it to. Because the way that it was described to me was the world is your oyster. Come in here. You can recruit anywhere. You can recruit in, you know, France. You can recruit in Africa. You can recruit here, wherever. So wherever I wanted to go find chemical engineers, mechanical, you know, electrical, I could do it. And so I started off, and 16 years late, 16 years later, here I am. So, do you start by finding the employers or the employees? Both, really. I mean, just whatever comes first. Okay. So yeah. most of the time, the co- I mean, the companies pay us. Mm-hmm. So you know that we don't. The candidates don't pay us anything. So it's kind of one of those things where most of the time it's going to start with a company saying we need this specific s- skill set. We'll pay you if you can find exactly what we're looking for better than we can find on our own. But we do have clients where when we find a dynamite candidate, we know would be a good fit in their culture, with the skills, with the comp they're looking for, location, whatever it may be, we, we'll send it to our client. We'll mm-hmm. talk to the person, hey, have you applied with this company? If not, we'd love to represent you. Yeah. And then we send it to them. And then the company might say, oh, my goodness, yeah, can we talk to them? Or they might say, love it. Thanks for thinking of us. Not right now. Mm-hmm. So, But most of the time it starts with a job that we find a person. But in this market, a really good candidate can be more valuable than a job because I've got more jobs on my board right now than I have the right sorts of candidates to fill them. So Mm -hmm. if I get a really good candidate, that's more money in my pocket in my own mind than I'm getting another job to Mm -hmm. work on. And what's cool is we can send candidates to the best companies out there. We're not going to waste our time with companies that aren't that great right now because there's so many jobs. We're going to take you to the best out there that we know and we're going to we're going to work that way. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, there's cool. right now it's job openings are a dime or a dozen. It's oh. the candidates that are the hard ones to find. Yep. So it's just constant uphill. Yeah. So, all right, Toby, what's yeah, your, so what's your let's story? See. I'll just start five years before I came to PCG. I was with a kind of national brand, publicly traded uh, accounting and finance recruiting firm. So I, w- I had a good five, good five year run there and started out well but it's a super micromanaged type place where everything is just about what your numbers are today, what your numbers are in the last five minutes. It's more reporting on what your numbers are than even you know, actually going out and achieving those numbers. So eventually I thought when I get to management here, I can kind of start putting my own things in place. This will get better. Not exactly how that worked. I got into management and then I had to become you know, the arm of this micromanagement. So I'm reporting to somebody and I'm reporting on my own numbers and reporting on the people that report to me their numbers. And I was like, this is ruining my life. So I was convinced at that point in time that I don't want anything to do with recruiting again, go try to find some other sort of sales job. The CYA 360 Business Leader Symposium returns to Baton Rouge in October. This all-day event focuses on the main threats to your business. Speakers will present on fiduciary duties, brand building, insurance strategies, cybersecurity, exit strategies, financial confidence, and executive wellness. Jay Johnson, coach of the National Champ LSU baseball team, will deliver the keynote address. Join us for the 2023 Business Leader Symposium, October 5th at the Renaissance. For tickets, go to CYA360.com. That's CYA360.com. Yeah, so going from a numbers to a relationship building, Mm -hmm. what, I mean, obviously you want to get away from just focusing on numbers and like get to that relationship side of things. Yeah, so the numbers, the the number driven part had to come from me internally because I wasn't going to get that from management, which was pretty life altering and changing. (laughs) Not have this bearing down on you. you. When you're living in that, like every waking moment is spent worried about that so it you know it affects your work life but it affects your personal life and your family life and all of that so you go from that to you working for somebody who really is concerned for your well-being and your family's well-being and not just the numbers it uh it's a weight off because there's always i mean in a sales business there's pressure regardless of how that goes so 
when the pressure comes from that as well as from the pressure on top and having their thumb on you um tough stuff like it gets hard to focus on the people and you get stuck with trying to meet these parameters mm-hmm. meet these goals and these guidelines where it's like if i don't meet them what is that going to say about me you know yeah well, what that does is it forces your approach to be different to That's where right. from i'm caring about these people who are trying to represent to i'm looking for a transaction you don't want to you don't want to be in that space That's right no i'd it's, rather i'd rather you know a, a potential placement fall apart than it not be right like you know like i like the, the last thing you want is for people somebody to take a job and make this life-altering decision because it's a real serious decision it's very very stressful for somebody to do if it's not the right thing so we've never had that pressure on us from our previous president or from ourselves as the current partners who own the company is we'd much rather play the long game not place a person or fill a job with a company and wait for that right person to come along for that company as opposed to, oh, let's just hurry up and, you know, make money. And you should do the right thing regardless, but when the upper echelon, the the high guys in your company are reporting to the shareholders and that sort of thing, those guys don't care about those individual candidates that and clients that you're working with, you Mm -hmm. know? Yeah. Um, So the way we manage it, I think it gives you the ability, the easy ability to do that. Play the long game, Mm -hmm. build the relationship, Keep everybody's best interest at heart ahead of yourself, and the money takes care of itself. Yeah, when it's you're not having to report those quarterly standings every quarter saying this is how much we've got because sometimes it's you want to land the deal, but it could take more than a quarter. Mm -hmm. And so then it's like, why aren't these deals closing? Why aren't we getting our return on investment? You have a lot more hands in the pot trying Mm -hmm. to get something when offering nothing. They just care about a number. Well, it's crazy because you get to the end of that quarter – I mean, even the end of that week. And this was our goal for this week. So I have this offer out. The, you know, the client doesn't need an answer until five days from now, but the quarter ends tomorrow. So I need to push to get this person to answer and accept tomorrow so that we hit a quarterly goal. And it's like, but that could blow what good the does, deal What up. good does that do? Right. <laughs> yeah, like, I mean, you've got this person who's deciding a life-altering decision. Exactly. Over you trying to hit this, but quota. It, doesn't, it doesn't matter three <laughs> layers up from you because no. they don't know yeah. the specifics of the deal. You know? Yeah, they're just like, why aren't you uh-huh. out there advocating? How could you do this? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. you would get that. How yeah. could you not close this person? Yeah. Right. Know? This discussion is the exact reason why there's a stigma within our industry. That's right. Yeah. Right of staffing, it's these guys are um, they're sharks, right? They're out to just make a transaction, like I was saying earlier. Or they're out to just you know put you in a job, whether they care about it or not. And so there are a lot of um, situations where when you're on the phone with somebody, you really have to explain to them, listen, we're not the same as a lot of the recruiters that have probably been reaching out to you. And here's why. Right. And a lot of it has to do with digging into personal life, digging into the whys. Right. Why are you looking to leave? What are your drivers and all that kind of stuff? So, um, you know, the last thing we want to be referred to as, you know, a shark or a headhunter or, you know, something like that. So it's all important. Yeah, the relationships matter, Mm -hmm. for sure. So, Jim, what's your story? My story? Wow, how much time you got? (laughs) Just ought to close us out. (laughs) (laughs) All right, let's start rolling the credits. That's it. Uh, Yeah. So, no, I I, not only am I, I'm also a customer or whatever. No, so uh, my my brother, I graduated in accounting. My brother went to work for a big four firm, and when he was there, one of the guys in his start class was leaving for an industry position gave my brother a card of this recruiter, Dan Prados, and he said, look, when you're ready to get out of here, this is your guy. He's going to find you a great job. He's awesome. So my brother got in touch with Dan, and um, and then when I started work, he said, man, you need to meet with Dan at PCG, get to know him because you're just getting started, but you want to know him throughout your career. He's going to be a great voice for you. So I went and met Dan for coffee. Um, Dan ended up placing my brother in a, an industry position, leaving public accounting a couple years later when my brother was ready to get out. And I stayed in touch with Dan, and um, and then he eventually down the road placed me in an industry position. Um, wonderful experience. He he advocated for me, um, and I would call him when I was working in public accounting. When I'd get frustrated, he would I'd say, "Man, you got this job out there. Put me up for this job." And he would say, "Jim, you don't want that. Look, that's not good for you. Hang in there. We'll find something better for you." So he could have made a quick buck, just shooting me out there. But he really did want what was in my best interest and what would be a good fit for me. So I knew. The character was there. 
And then when I was in industry, I actually had another recruiting agency reach out about me wanting me to become a recruiter, and I wouldn't even consider it because they had so much turnover and, and just the reputation they had, and I knew about that. And so, again, nothing against those people. Love those people. It's just not what I would be interested in. So, uh, so then um, – I thought I'd never have a chance to get into recruiting. Dan doesn't remember this. I, I spoke with him when I was in public. Man, how do you become a recruiter? It sounds so cool. You're just talking with accountants and matching people up. He was like, oh, I love it. It's great. He said, but yeah, we don't have any spots. So I was like, oh, okay. We're all full here. We're, at the end. we're all full, man. But uh, so then, um, you know, I was I was a controller in industry. And Dan said, hey, Chip Kurth, who had been with the firm for 30 years, was retiring. We thought we had a couple more years with him. But um, he's going to be retiring. We're looking for somebody who has the accounting background likes working with people and doesn't like accounting do you know of anyone doesn't like accounting yeah and so uh of course dense jim says wow that sounds great i'll see if i can think anybody hung up the phone and then uh, wait a minute he wanted it to be my idea so i called him back and i met i had it a lot easier than these guys i was one interview oh so you might I, just interview a lot better than us and he doesn't have a wife that's true oh, that makes it easier well, see that see, makes it a whole lot that easier cuts like six steps out yeah because then it's like well <laughs> you there's have to no, no we're talking yeah. to the real decision maker now there you from go. the first interview that's right you know, not yeah well let me let me, let me bring it back the to the family that's right. bring it back to the boss so they're yeah. like no no bring the boss in that's mm-hmm. who we're going to talk to and pitch but for you yeah. they're like some young kid you know you know so so i called dan and left him this rambling voicemail where i realized he was wanting me to you know, see if I was interested. And uh, and so then he said, well, let's meet for coffee this Saturday. So I went and met with him for coffee, and lo and behold, Frank was there. I didn't know Frank was going to be there. I was so embarrassed. I was wearing shorts and a T-shirt. I walk in, and we sat in this coffee shop, and we talked for three hours, and it felt like 10 minutes. I mean, it was just seamless. Wow, I want this. I knew they were being honest about the good, the challenges, the potential. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and I think even back then, I don't remember when exactly, but there was some thought of maybe Dan had mentioned to me, you know, about look, look around. Like we're not all gonna be doing this for the next forty years. Like there's gonna be potential for you know, for, for you to move up. And so there was just a lot about it I loved. I knew the character and the integrity, the reputation. Even my mom, my mom was an accountant and she used to say, Oh, personal consulting group that's a very very impressive agency they send out really good people so it was just one of those where, where there was a lot there that i wanted to be a part of and associate with um and so I've, I've been there six and a half years and um you know love love working with people love building relationships i mean that's it's so great you can do a lot of things and make a good living but it's so gratifying when you see somebody at a conference and they're like 25 years ago your company plays me i love my job they've gotten to make a living for their family and, and be a part of something special and um just fill in those gaps where a company's been trying and they can't find what they're looking for or that person's out there and they're not they want that next big thing and you get to bring that together i mean it's i mean i can't i can't think of anything i'd rather do mm-hmm. it's fantastic this episode is proudly presented by gage gage is a local company here in baton rouge louisiana for over 40 years gage has provided businesses with the very best telecommunications it and standby power services available. Gage has a variety of services, including Gage Cloud Voice. It is the last phone system your business will ever need. You need to give your business the ability to be accessible anytime, anywhere, and with Gage's cloud-based phone system, you'll be able to accomplish just that. Not only do they have Gage Cloud Voice, they have fully managed IT services that are proactive network monitoring, 24-7, 365, help desk, business, content, Continuity, they are there for you. What you're also going to need is some cybersecurity. Gage is there to safeguard your business from potential cyber threats, even when you aren't aware they exist. Gage also is power and leaders in standby generators. They are the number one Cummins dealer on the Gulf Coast and provide generators to homes and businesses of any size so you can keep life going. Gage, better connected, a proud sponsor of the Patty G Show. So when you were in public, did you work at a big four or were mm-hmm. you at a smaller firm? I did big four. I did, look, I my career was built for me to do this without me even realizing it. I did big four. Then I worked with a very large regional CPA firm. And then I worked in a big corporate department and in industry. And then I worked as a controller for a closely held company. So no matter what somebody's done, I've been in that space. You know, I did internal audit as an intern. I did the CIA exam, went through that at LSU. Did the CPA exam. You know, so... so I wasn't planning it that way. I wasn't like, oh, let me do all these things so I'll be able to understand every piece of it. But it just kind of worked out that way. 
And ha- how has your background helped with the staffing in yeah. that technical field? For sure. So a lot of ways. I mean, I, I you know, as an alumni of a big four firm, um, you know, I, I, I can go to their alumni events, you know, for people who work there and, and have left. Um, Tell them there's light at the end of the tunnel. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, and then for the regional firm, too, the regional firm I work for, they, they have alumni events and networking for people who used to work there. And it makes sense for them because those can be clients for them in the future, right? So, um, and they want to, you know, they know public's not for everybody. Very few people stay their whole career. You know, it is what it is. It's a great place to learn. I don't regret it for, for a minute. And I encourage people. I actually wrote, um, you know, a, a, a blog entry on LinkedIn about how, look, don't just leave public to leave public. Make sure, like, if you're, if you're doing so-so and you're not miserable, stay because you're adding incredible value for your career and it'll make you more marketable when you look to leave. So I, I think it's just different for everybody. Um, but no, I mean, it's it's really, I mean, I really you know feel like it's pretty much divine intervention that everything came together for me to be where I'm at today and I'm so grateful for it. So you came in with a little bit of a foresight into what your career could be. But Michael and Toby, I mean, were y'all given that kind of same talking point within the six to 12 interviews that y'all had? That was nowhere on my radar that I could be, you know, an owner of this, you know, down the road. Again, I kind of even joined kicking and screaming because I didn't want to be in recruiting anymore. Um, So really, that was nowhere. I kind of always thought that when Frank retired, I would just leave and start my own thing on the side, maybe even, you know, Mm -hmm. with Michael or, you know, with Jim as well. Um, so when when that when this possibility came up and we could kind of do that without having to unplug and start fresh, I mean, it was almost like a dream come true. But you also have to focus on time frame too, right? I mean, Toby had a family started, I think, by then, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. You know, you had a family mm-hmm. started. There was a lot relying on you to continue making a good living. Mm-hmm. With me, I mean, I hadn't even gotten married yet. Yep. Right, and so um, to to get back into a, uh, an industry where 100% commission is where we're at, right? I mean, that's that's where we want to be as recruiters. That's a daunting task, right? And yeah. You're okay, so I'm I'm not recruiting what I used to recruit for the past five six years. I'm going to start something completely new and learn a completely mm-hmm. new industry. So it's a lot harder for him than it was for me. Yeah, for me it was let's rock and roll, right? Because I didn't know any better. Yeah. You know? You, yeah. eat, you eat what you kill. Yeah. yeah. And that that, I, that was another advantage I had. I didn't have kids, no family, none of that. So it was the kind of thing where I remember having that conversation with my mentors, my brother, my friends. Like, look, if I completely bomb and I'm not good at this, I'll just, you know, liquidate some stock that I've saved up and live off of that. And then I'll go back and do accounting, you know. And, and so that was, you know, that was kind of the safety net I had. Um, which I mean, that's that's what's so, that's what's so interesting about hiring recruiters and giving people the opportunity to do what we do. You know what I've learned in my many many weeks of uh, you know of doing that kind of thing. <laughs> no, you know whatever. we've hired, we've we've been hiring people together for probably about a year and a half now, almost two years. Is that you got to find somebody who's good at what we do, mm-hmm. wants to do what we what we do, and wants to do it with us and our culture so that's it's a very very narrow fit because we've had some people that we love who they just didn't feel like our culture was for them and we've just had some, had some people that love the thought of what we do but they just don't want to be calling people all day. they don't want to make sales calls. they don't want to call companies and say, hey can we can we work with you you know or they just they don't like talking to candidates whatever it may be you know uh, being on the phone all day they just it sounds great and it's exciting but for them they don't gravitate to that so it's when, especially when you when you think about the world of recruiting and you think about the world of scouting potential great candidates, you see, you know, it's a lot easier now with your LinkedIn. You know, you can have sure. people reach out, direct message and whatnot. You can see them on professional light and how great they're doing. But it's almost as if when you're calling somebody who's currently employed and you don't know they're looking for another job, you're like, hey, so I know this may be cheating on your current employer, <laughs> mm-hmm. but let's just have a conversation. That's right. Just you and me. No one yeah. has to know about it. Yeah. No one has to know. That's right. Let's go have lunch. Oh, <laughs> it's like you yeah. feel like, all right, hang on. This is kind of dirty. Yeah. What are we doing here? <laughs> I've had talks with people where they go out in the stairwell. They're standing by the side of the interstate. Your 18 wheelers going by <laughs> in the background. And you got so, after hours calls. Yeah. And, yeah. But, you know, that's the thing is that and, and we're not just saying that. That's not bait for us. Like we don't want someone to leave their job. 
unless this would be a significant life change for the better mm -hmm. for them. And that could mean anything. It could mean money or it could mean less hours. It could mean less travel. It could, whatever it may be. So our goal when we're introducing ourselves to someone is, look, I just want to hear what good is for you so I know when to call you and I don't call you when something's not what you're looking for. I'm not trying to talk you into quitting your job or walking away from your life or whatever it may be. Like, I just want to be, I would just want to know what would be good for you. Yeah. But then, honestly, if, if everybody was happy and fulfilled in their job, we would be out of business. That's right. Because yeah. there's, there's nothing we can do. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Yeah, and if, you know, if anybody pays attention to anything going around social media, there's now these videos of people confronting their bosses and fighting them and doing really? different things. Yeah. Have you not seen this? Yeah. Yeah, they had a, they had a guy. Sam probably knows. About Sam, oh, Sam for sure knows. I'm about sure he does. They, they had a, they had a particular video that I, that comes to mind every time somebody says poor workplace environment, where the individual was on the call with their HR director and was like, "Your performance has dropped off since last year," and he chirps back with, "Well, yeah, because last year y'all said I was only getting a raise because that's what y'all equated my value to at the at the small increment, and that." This year, y'all would expect me to continue going above and beyond, but y'all weren't going to compensate me for that. So I did what y'all are paying me to do and nothing extra. Mm. So yeah, my performance slacked off mm -hmm. because I'm not going above and beyond if there's no room for advancement, there's no room for growth, there's mm. no room for pay increase. I'm not doing it. Mm. And then you just hear like dead silence on the other end. So like that person you probably want to reach out to and probably had lots of <laughs> contacts in the a, in a comments of recruiters. Hey, call me. We'll get you a better yeah. job. Mm. Yeah. But it's, I think... COVID kind of gave people a step back and a realization of, am I really happy? Right. Am I really happy yeah. doing what I'm doing? Well, and, and the script has flipped completely. I mean, when I started work in 2009, it was the Great Recession. We were so grateful to have a job. If our firm told us to show up somewhere, we would show up. We would do whatever they want. Saturdays, weekends, you name it. We didn't like, oh, my goodness, I want to make a living. Now, human nature is what it is, whether it's the company with the leverage or the candidate. And now people are in the position where they can be as demanding as they want. In some cases, if their skill set is desirable and this company really is a need, they can get a lot more out of it. So it's just intriguing to see some of the most respected, well-liked companies in the world that a couple of years ago would have told them, oh, we'll make them an offer. They don't take it right away. We're pulling it. Now they're begging for people as good, the best companies you can think of because it's so hard. And, and people are reciprocating that. They're being as picky and demanding as they want. And they'll, yeah. you know, they get everything they want when you talk to them. Hey, what do you want? They give you all their list. You get everything on the list, and then they still say, nah, no thanks. The employer has lost the upper hand. Yeah. So How? How did we get here? There's, there's more, jo there's more jobs yeah. available than there mm -hmm. are people to fill these jobs. So the, yeah. And especially even the, if the hiring process is really arduous and there's all these hoops to jump through like a oh, good candidate, not doing it. I'm not filling out this you know, questionnaire for you before I even talk to anybody. Like yeah. It's just not going to happen. Yeah. So if I got to do all this stuff on the front end, you just won't even see them because right. I, I don't have time They're for not going to do it. Well, and a lot of that is succession planning going on right now, right? So a lot of these companies are having to deal with a lot of retirement. And so when you're dealing with retirement, you're, you're bringing in a new age of Gen Z, Gen X, you know, all of these different types of personalities. Have you, ever, have you heard of the quiet quitting? Yeah. Right? So that's extremely unique and was, was news to me when I started hearing about that kind of stuff, right? But then you wonder, why is that going on? Where is this going to lead? You know, what's your, what's your plan here? Because if you're gonna if you're gonna go if you're gonna constantly think that you're that marketable or, or everybody's gonna want to hire you, yeah. you're gonna gain a reputation, that's right. right? And so that's uh, a big part about what we do is also try to convince and talk to candidates about all right, what's your approach here? When when we're working together, um, how are you going to go in and give notice? How are you gonna do all this kind of stuff? Because you don't want to burn bridges. Mm -hmm. Your reputation is everything. So it's it's been interesting to work with HR as they're learning to deal with their own employees of that age group, right? And how they work and what's important to them, right? You know, um, vacation, very important, right? Um, some remote, right? Hybrid schedules, all that kind of stuff is very important to that age group when it's not important at all the to boomers. the baby boomers. Who yeah. are on the way? And the ones, that, say, but the, they're on the way out. On the right. way out. But that's the challenge. I mean, seventy-five percent nationally of CPAs are retirement age. Seventy-five percent. And didn't we have a big drop, like overnight drop off during COVID of CPAs that were Absolutely. just like we're going to retire? No one's sitting for the exam. All these people are retiring. Um, the number of people majoring in accounting is about half of what it was five years ago. 
it's 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 crazy. Yeah, you know, we're we're gonna we'll have some off-air conversations, but like hiring in an accounting world in a CPA firm is dang near impossible. It's mm-hmm. it's brutal. You're, when when we go to check off the lists at the universities for their business networking receptions, we're not just checking off accounting. I'm doing accounting. I'm doing business. I'm doing finance. I'm doing management. Mm-hmm. I'm doing entrepreneurship. Yeah, you're adding all these degree programs sure. because it's like where where are the people? Yeah, where did they go? What are they and doing? It's even harder in Louisiana because my whole career, the people who were graduating in accounting were all moving to Houston, Dallas, Denver, Atlanta, all these places. So. 75 percent nationwide or retirement nation louisiana it's got i mean i don't know the numbers we don't have asked the cpa society they don't have specific numbers on louisiana but it's got to be in the 80s because such a small percentage of accounting graduates stayed in louisiana beginning 20 years ago um so it's going to be it's going to be a challenge and and it's going to create a lot of opportunity for people who do go into accounting Mm -hmm. i joke and tell people when they ask me about it look if you're if you've got an ounce of ambition and an ounce of skills, you're going to be wildly successful in this economy because there's literally not enough people to catch the bucket of what's coming down the hill with all these. Rec- Patty G Show is proudly brought to you by Mimosa Handcrafted Jewelry. Mimosa Handcrafted Jewelry is a local business right here in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. They create handcrafted jewelry for everyday use, that special occasion, whatever it may be. Gentlemen, they've got amazing jewelry both for male and female. Everyone is their audience. You know, after years of experimenting with everything from ceramic jewelry, glass beads, and enamel, they've settled in on the ancient art of lost wax casting is their main form of creating their work. They cast everything in bronze, sterling silver, and 14 karat gold. Every step of the way is done here right in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Proud, proud sponsors of the Patty G Show, Mimosa Handcrafted Jewelers. Get out there and tell them that Patty G sent you, and they're going to take great care of you on your next order. And it's not any better in engineering or in the construction field either. Right. We're getting there. We've got all these infrastructure projects coming up, and who's going to do the work about this is going to create this many jobs it's like okay who's going to fill them (laughs) yeah (laughs) okay yeah or where are we pulling these people from i mean that's Mm -hmm. uh, we i've had conversations time again i'm like where are these people going what are they doing because it's not a louisiana specific situation Mm -hmm. it's like a national Mm -hmm. effect that we're seeing this ripple caused by like what what is it being caused by it's kind of where we're always left at and so like from a recruiting standpoint what are y'all seeing in the industry and in the market and the trends that of people looking to move and switch jobs? Like what is, what is happening? Well, I'll start with this is that within chemical plants and refineries, and I was talking about this earlier, it, it's a carousel right now because um, where are we finding these people? Each company is taking from each other, right? So one company will go grab from another company, which will create another opening over there. And so it's just this this life cycle going round and round where uh, companies are kind of left holding the bag. And, and what do we do? How do we be more competitive? Right. Because that's compensation benefits. And they're, they're trying to look at that. But then internally, they don't want to upset that. Right. Because you've got to deal with people that have a larger hiring budget right. and have a maintenance budget mm-hmm. maintaining the employees. That's right. right. Because you don't want to upset your whole comp structure. Right. It's really hard in companies with big, like in the accounting, big accounting departments. So if I'm, let's say, if I'm a construction company and I have a controller and that's it, I can go pay what I need to to get that person. But if I have 20 senior accountants and all 20 of them have been here for 15 years and now i got to go get another senior accountant and i got to pay that person 25% more than I pay my other 20 Word gets out through the grapevine, I'm going to have a lot of upset people are going to mm-hmm. quit on me. So that's a really challenging thing, and that gets to the things he's talking about. What can what can candidates and companies negotiate well on? Vacation. There's things like that where, look, we can bring you in. Our comp structure can't go right where you want, but we'll give you a lot of PTO. Mm-hmm. You accomplish these things, we'll give you good incentive pay. And here's what will come in down the road for growth for you. Um, you know, and that's, that's what you got to do to, to, to get candidates because yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's brutal out there. And once again, you have to figure out what the candidate mm-hmm. is interested in, That's right. right? Yeah. Where, what's going to move what's the yes needle for them. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it's just to get a salary increase. Then, oh, we can't do it. Yeah. Then they might leave you in two years yeah. or when they go turn in their resignation. That's, so, that's the yeah. least yeah. attractive thing. When we talk to a candidate is they say, well, I really want more money. It's like, well. Why would I send you anywhere? Because you're going to go get a counter offer and turn mm-hmm. down this company. Now, if they say, well, you know, my management team doesn't 
work with me or oh I want upside I want growth or I'm traveling too much or I want more work life well, balance promise this for the last three years it's never come through I mean right. it's, it can be a legitimate yeah, sure, a little you know, legitimate you, concern you, absolutely you, I want more money well what are you making and you're like oh yeah okay yeah they're grossly under, if they're grossly yeah. underpaid then sure but you no know, if somebody's paid well and they're just like well I really want an extra 10 percent then it's just like that's a worse candidate to deal with because they're going to burn you and the yeah. client they're not they just they want more money we want people who want lifestyle changes, and something that's better for them holistically. Mm -hmm. So, and how do you balance those inquiries? Meaning you get candidates that come in and it's either close to their annual evaluation or it's close to the end of the year. And they're saying, why don't I see if I can just leverage another offer to get a higher pay? How do you kind of, how, first off, how do you feel that candidate? What do you do? Yeah, you if have you to discover? be vocal and talk to them about all of those questions. You've got to bring them all up. Sometimes they're hard to talk about, and sometimes, especially engineers, aren't going to want to talk. They're not going to want to talk, right? So you really have to get that and pry that information out of them. If they allow you to. Well, if they allow you to, of <laughs> course. But if they don't allow you to, then there's something they're hiding, or at yeah. least you think they are. And, and a lot of that is emotional intelligence and doing what we've done for so many years. You talk to somebody, and once you've talked to them a few times, you can really start to tell. Yeah, you can feel out who they are and what they're really about. And you know, you, you it, re recruiter intuition. You talk about that all the time, right? You mm -hmm. talk to somebody, you're like something just doesn't seem right. Really about that. You can kind of sense mm -hmm. it. And so, so that's that's a very big tool for us. And that's a great service we provide for clients. We, it's not 100. percent We can't promise anything, but we try to get out front of those things. The best thing about our process is we want there to be as few surprises as possible for everybody. We want to be as transparent as possible with the candidates with the companies and make sure everybody knows everything we know at all times so that nobody's like, oh my goodness, I didn't see that coming. Yeah. I mean, because that ultimately has happened very much so on recent occasion where it's like people are going, they'll get that offer and say, go back to their job. Look, this is what I'm yeah. offered. Yeah. Can you match it? Can you yeah. exceed it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and then you end up getting in this bidding war if somebody's That's interviewing right. in multiple places. Yeah. And we've seen that where somebody yeah. came in and was like, well, this other company really offered me this. That's kind of where I'm at. And it's like, you're just, okay, you're not going to be a good culture fit anyways. You know, and then it right. goes back to that ultimate question of, will they be a good culture fit? Do they like what we're after? Mm -hmm. Do they like what we're able to provide to them? Yeah. But right. then it also depends on how bad is the pain of this hiring organization. Like, there are mm -hmm. some cases where I need this person and I'm willing to put up and overlook a lot of warts and things that we're worried about because yeah. I have this project coming up and this has to get done and this seat cannot yeah. be empty. Yeah. And and you try to get out front of that as early as you can, like he was saying, with the candidate, you know, all right, a counter offer is going to come if they like you. What's the reaction going to be when you walk in and put in your notice? Are they going to tell you to get out or are they going to try to keep you? Are they going to throw more money at you? What would you say then? Right. And if they say, well, you know, if it was the right money, I would stay. Then the conversation becomes, well, why don't you talk with your company? in advance of going through this process and mm -hmm. dragging yourself and us and our client through it, just tell your company, look, I want to be here. I'm paid below market. If you can get me where I need to be, I'm all in. I'm doing this long term. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. It's much better to have that conversation than for them to go in with an offer and try to leverage it. So how has that side of y'all's business played out and changed over the years where you're initially trying to grab people and match them with jobs? But now you're almost saying, well, wait, do you really need to hire? Wait, do you really need a different job? How has that shifted y'all's conversations, both from a client and candidate perspective, as well as a financial perspective? Because you're not making money to flip that conversation sometimes. Right. Well, I think the good thing about there being this many jobs out there is that we're making plenty of placements. Mm -hmm. So there's not like... If somebody's passionate about building relationships and they genuinely care about their clients and candidates in our organization, they're going to be wildly successful and make a ton of money and be fine in this market. I think the challenge is just um, coaching up companies that aren't used to being in this environment to put the candidates ahead of themselves. Mm -hmm. And that's the challenge because companies are so used to saying, well, they need to put forth the effort and come to us. It's like, no, they don't because they're getting in mails from every recruiter on earth, internal recruiters for companies, agencies like us. I mean, everybody on earth is, is hounding these people. It's hard to get people to respond right now. So that's the challenge is getting companies to understand how difficult it is and getting them to not lowball the person and lose them on the front end when they find somebody they like or drag the process so long that a company that's more nimble picks them up. 
I feel I feel like a lot of especially companies that are larger that have hired or do a lot of hiring, they're coming around to that and seeing that a lot more than they were, you know, three years ago. Three years ago. So yeah. that yeah. part, they are coming to the realization that we can't do things the way we used to. Well, do they're it. forced to. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, things that fall apart at the end that they maybe would have been ticked at me for before mm-hmm. they are completely understanding of it now because they've they've seen it and experienced it enough on their own so I, I feel like you know some of the smaller mom and pop shops that maybe just haven't hired anybody in 10 years you got to educate them on mm-hmm. that a little bit but yeah thank you so very much to building five for the becoming the latest sponsor of the patty g show we are going to be filming once a month at building five we're going to post about it on our social so you can come and visit with us building five is an excellent food establishment, if you're into sharing boards and really getting a creative menu, Misty and Brumby have done an excellent job of creating an environment that's warm, welcoming, and inviting for every single occasion. Go on over to Building 5 in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and tell them what the Patty G Show sent you. We always tell them, please try to keep the people you got. Much easier to do that. I want you to call me because you're growing. I don't want you to call me because you blew it and you had a good person and they left. So how does that conversation go when somebody calls you and says, we had somebody just leave? What yeah. are we doing? Mean, do, are they, are, are y'all in a position or do y'all kind of have those conversations where you're like, we'll help you figure out what's going on in your organization? Mm-hmm. Is that something y'all yeah. even do? Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, that's important to us. Um, you know, we want, we don't want to put anyone in a position where it's going to be a revolving door. So we always ask the company, why is this position available? And like, like, you know, you mentioned number one, the best thing to hear is growth or succession, somebody's retiring or strategic, something like that. The worst thing you want to hear is, well, yeah, we, we've been running through people like crazy. We've hired six people in the last six months and that kind of thing. So the question always is, well, what's causing that? So we try to get to the root of it. We try to help them understand structurally what needs to change. So they're either not paying enough to get the skills they need, they're expecting too much out of the person, if a bad manager is running this person out, something like that. Yeah. So then we try to figure out if, if it's something that can be addressed. If it can't be addressed, we might work on the position, but we'd be very transparent with candidates and tell them, look, this is a challenging environment. They've had a lot of turnover. If, you, we, if you're going to go meet with this company, I'd recommend you ask them what they're going to do to give you the resources you need to be successful, what's going to change. The, the burden of proof is on them mm-hmm. as to why you should go there. And what's. And then some people get excited. They love a turnaround. They want to get in there and fix it and build this thing out, and, that's, and that revs them up. Somebody like that, go get them. But... We try to be as transparent as possible because we don't want there. We don't want to damage our reputation, you know, dealing dealing. Yeah, there's some some companies that we just don't want to work with. Right. I mean, right. There's clients that you just don't want to yeah. represent, and there's some that you like. I'm only going to send somebody that's unemployed, right? Like that's the because that's the only way that's going to help somebody is if mm-hmm. they need a paycheck and this is the position that's open. Yeah. So, and how do you go about getting new clients to help? What's the, what is that process? What do the meetings look like? Initial yeah. step, la- launch pad. You have to know your customer, really, to start engaging in those conversations because sometimes, and I'll tell you, 80% of my business is South Louisiana, and the stigma on chemical plants is that it's a lot of good old boy mentality, right? People that have been working in these plants for 20-plus years, they do things that way because, A, they see it as working, and then, B, they just don't, they don't feel like changing. It's just too hard. Right. And so if you have HR customers or or hiring manager customers that are that way and you're trying to say, hey, man, we really need to to change this, this and that, you're going to be talking to a wall. And that's unfortunate, but you just have to know your customer to have those conversations. Some will be very open to that um, and they'll appreciate it. And some won't. And in this market, we don't really do a lot of specific marketing to new clients. Um, business just comes to us because there, everybody needs people so bad. We've legit got government agencies calling us, asking for help, willing to pay fees, and that would have never happened five, 10, 15 years ago. I don't doubt it. Yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, just, it, just being in the no CPA people. world, oh. I have no doubt yeah. that you're not getting calls from national, federal yeah. agencies. That's right. To so, fill their positions. Yeah. So, so, but in in a tougher market, if there weren't as many jobs, a lot of it's through the best is through um, repeat business from gl- growing customers. Mm-hmm. You know, we've worked with some private equity on the accounting side. I'm, you know, they can speak to their customers as well. On the accounting side, we've worked with some private equity backed companies in Baton Rouge where we built the entire accounting department. We, they give us an exclusive, and they're the only firm we work with, and they love what we do. And we might place. I mean, literally five, six, eight accountants with them in a year, you know, analysts, everything you can think of they need. 
Um, that's the best type of business. And then referrals from them to people they respect and know a lot better than us just cold calling. But we'll, we'll do that if we see a, a company we want to work with and they're running an ad. We'll reach out to them and hit them up. And then some of it's going to the conferences, you know, the, the continuing education events, um, just being in front of them and letting them know, hey, look, we're, you know, it's, it's sales but not. Because if you're an insurance person, everybody needs insurance. But right. if you're not looking to hire a six-figure, you know, accountant or engineer, whatever it may be, well, we can't make you create that opening. But mm -hmm. we want to build that relationship and the trust and let you know we're going to be here your whole career. You're going to be working with the same recruiter for the next 30 years. So that's pretty cool. So when that need is there, we're the one you call. And that is pretty cool. I mean, y'all spoken about leadership teams that were in position at y'all's organization and how... The only time that y'all had a position open was either when y'all were growing or you had a 30, 40 plus year person, person. Mm -hmm. retire. Retire. That's We've right. got three people of our 13 that are over 30 years. We just had one 44 years retire. We had mm -hmm. one 30 years retire a couple years ago. I mean, it's it's a very special place. Yeah. So how do y'all go about maintaining that internally when you're spending so much time outside recruiting for other people? What do you do to kind of keep things at home at bay? I think part of it is we want people that we hire as recruiters to want it. We never, we always try to undersell and push on the difficulties of our business and what we do when we're talking to people. Um, we wouldn't change a thing about what we do. We love it. We love our company. We're passionate about it. We love helping our clients and candidates, but we don't want someone to come in and think this is just easy. Mm -hmm. So we explain to them the challenges and you go through droughts and you go through difficult times and you'll go through stretches where you feel like, oh man, I got to turn down. I had, you know, somebody's working with a competitor. I'm never going to make a placement again. And you just got to fight through it and be faithful to do the work and then a bunch of stuff's going to come back and start going that you didn't see coming. So, you know, um, so I think that's a big part of it is going through the process of wanting to know and trust the people we're hiring before we bring them in. So we know what they're made of. So we're confident that's that's not going to be a challenge. Mm -hmm. um, but if you have an immediate need, if somebody in our team in a vital desk walked away tomorrow, we might have to figure out a way around that. Mm -hmm. But um, but, you know, it's it's. We want to be the kind of place people want to be for 30 years. But I think we want to carry forward the legacy of what was kind of handed over to us as well. Like mm -hmm. I talked about going from, you know, numbers based to relationship based. So we want to care for the people that work for us far more than we care about what they produce for us. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we try to come up with all sorts of ways to make them feel that. And uh, you know, yeah. I think we're kind of learning that on the fly. But we had a a really good example of how to live that out too. That's right. Yeah. So do y'all still do the six interview process for people that y'all bring on? <laughs> yeah, pretty <laughs> much. Uh, Close. I mean, we like to think like at this at this stage, like we're trying to grow and we're not looking at like we need to hire somebody to do this. We more try to look at all of the relationships we have, the people we know and say that person could do something. That here. person could do something here. Yeah. And well, we, then we'll bring them in and just kind of talk about what we do, all the different divisions, mm -hmm. and then it kind of comes about where could you see yourself, you know, doing this yeah. here if they're interested. But you got to remember, we haven't been in ownership, but maybe for almost a year now, right? So we've been blessed to jump in where the industry is just rocking and rolling. Uh, yeah. And so we haven't really had to worry about that yet, but we know it's coming at some yeah. point, right? We've, we've got 13 people on our team. One's planning to retire in April. We've got five of our team members that have been with us for under two years. And then you got us three kind of in the middle. And then a couple of folks who have great tenure, been there for decades. So it's this very interesting dynamic. Mm -hmm. um, and But the last three people we've hired, we might have had some initial conversations with them or even really not. And then they pursued us. And they said, I want to do this. I want to do this. And they were beating down the door to want to be a part of this. So that gives you a much higher likelihood of success than if we're just saying, hey, can you please come work with us? Can you come try this? Mm -hmm. um, in the person that's starting for us in a couple months of September, I've been talking with for over a year about this. Yeah. And just off and on conversations. Is the time right? Do you feel like this is what you want to do? That's the best way to get in front of it is, is you know, doing that. Mm. Welcome to the brand new Falaya mobile app. We took all the same tech that's helped hundreds of people sell their homes themselves and packed it into an easy to use app for your phone. When you download the Falaya mobile app on either the Apple or Android app store, you'll immediately be able to see the power of this game-changing tool. From the seller's dashboard, you can navigate to all the information that you need. We intentionally separated everything into key groups, such as tasks to be completed, 
buyer leads for your listing and contact information for everyone involved through closing. When you get an offer on your property, you can simply review and respond all within the app. No matter where you are in the world, you'll be able to monitor everything that's going on with your property from listed to sold. It's truly the power of Falaya in the palm of your hand. Download the app and see for yourself. Falaya, it's real estate reimagined. So when y'all made the switch into ownership and y'all became the, the entrepreneurs of the organization, how did that affect what y'all did on a day-to-day -day basis? Well, life changed the most for Jim. Yeah, <laughs> sure did. I don't his, work a desk anymore. His world so. got turned upside. Mike, Michael and I, other than... Um, our meeting once a, yeah, we, once a week. You know, we, <laughs> we, we now manage and have a more sense of growing our own divisions, divisions mm -hmm. as part of ownership there. And then, you know, providing input and, you know, Mm -hmm. I guess suggestions and that sort of things when we get together, but Jim is really yeah. I think the, to the the beautiful thing about the partnership that we have is that we're all very good at certain things, mm -hmm. right? I could not do what Jim does. I am not a numbers guy. I'm not a you know a dollar cents guy, a bottom line guy by any means. I'm a social, personable guy who likes to get out and you know make relationships and uh, and build trust and all that. But I could not sit behind a desk and help the company with that part of the business. Just can't do it. If it was just Michael and I taking over, this would We'd be in trouble. Would be wild. <laughs> <laughs> so you're saying Jim's like the glue that kind of keeps yeah. you so together. So he's, I mean, he's got the accounting background, so he, a he controller. knows all of that. I've done he knows how to stuff. run a business from that standpoint. Yeah. So it's, it's the perfect, I mean, I'm not joking when I say divine intervention. Mm -hmm. Like we really believe that this was just orchestrated by God to like give us this opportunity to be a part to be a part of these people's lives and do something that's really important and valuable. Mm -hmm. And we're we're really excited about that. And the, and the fact that you know we have Julie who joined us, our our newest accounting recruiter. She joined us back in um, January, and like we were talking about it in the fall. And she interviewed we interviewed her for about six months, about four and a half months. And it was just kind of like, she you might do be this. Better than Jim oh, she's recruiting. a much better recruiter than I am. I mean, it's a huge <laughs> upgrade for the recruitment side. You know, but it was kind of, if we didn't have her, there's no way I could have dove wow. into working with our back office the way we have. I'm learning how to back up payroll. Somebody's got to do that, right? You know, there's the things we're doing now, mm -hmm. thinking strategically, building our social media presence as a brand, as a company, so that people will gravitate to our organization, not just the recruiter. Yes, the recruiter's important. That's your contact, that's your person. But we want to be, we want that same level of care organization-wide, regardless of who your person you work with is. Um, just thinking strategically about how we can grow, what that looks like, you know, all those back office things. We couldn't have done if I was trying to work a full desk and and recruit for twelve jobs. Mm -hmm. So um, so it's been it's been a blast, and I'm passionate about trying to pour into our new recruiters we're hiring. You know, supervising our, our tech recruiter who's doing fantastic. He's doing an incredible job. We're gonna have record number of tech recruitment this year, and he's been with us since September. I mean, he's killing it, and we've had the tech division for the whole company's history. So, I mean, we've got some incredible talent under our roof, and I'm just so excited to get to pour into them and work with them and be there for them and try to try to do what I can to, to, to help them grow their mm -hmm. business. So when y'all's podcast coming out? Like, <laughs> <laughs> this is a trial This is the first time y'all sat down and done first this, first you know? We were actually talking about putting a sitcom together <laughs> right, right, first right. for a while, yeah, but yeah. There's, there's never been like a recruiting sitcom. No. I think we'll see how cool. this looks, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Hey, yeah, yeah. We'll come back here. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get y'all's notes on everything and make sure <laughs> yeah. like, hey, how does this, how does this look? But yeah. I mean, there's just, there's so much chemistry here. Y'all could sit down and, and <laughs> bounce you. things off. I love Appreciate that. So, yeah. but we have to start kind of winding our show down. Sure. Yeah. So we do have a set list of questions. Mm -hmm. I'm sure he sent y'all. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I know good. nothing about have... it. Oh, yeah. all right. Right. Let her rip. Blame Jim on that one. <laughs> so well, we ask well, the same well. guests. We ask every guest the same question. So the first one is, what is something you did as a kid you wish you could still do today? Mm -hmm. And since Jim kind of, you know, brought this whole show together, we're going to put wow. him in the hot seat. So uh, I really, really, really loved um, in the summers when I was a kid on Fridays, I would, me and my brother would go over to my grandparents' house and we'd play cards with them, we'd eat lunch with them, and we'd just spend time with them. And they were fantastic. I really missed them. That was a wonderful, wonderful experience. My grandmother used to, um, she would run the, the dances, uh, the big band old people dances, <laughs> said it in a loving way. And so all Friday, all our friends would be calling trying to get a seat at her table. And uh, so I just really enjoyed my time with them. They were fantastic and missed them. So that was, that was a very good memory I had as a kid. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I think for me it would be able to just run around all day on a Saturday playing football or baseball, wiffle ball, and like still be able to walk the next day. Right. Like just, you know, I was telling them earlier, I took my boys out who were going to eighth grade to the track. We were going to run some 100 meter sprints and, you know, do some other type of uh, conditioning stuff. And man, it just does not work anymore. <laughs> So I, I miss the days of being able to go outside with my brother and neighborhood friends and stuff and oh, just yeah. play ball all day. Well, I mean, the problem was you didn't have the right quarterback. You know, hey, some yeah. I mean, some, uh, some of us in here had you know the privilege of having a great quarterback. I'd have just been six you know. four. I think I could have been that guy. <laughs> but have my hair. Right? Toby might have had the arm, but he didn't have the size. Yeah, I think uh, my answer to that would be just going back to playing organized ball, similar to Toby. Right? I just loved my high school time it was a it was a it was a fantastic time small school small high school 2a and um you know a, a spin to the question would be well, what would i do differently right because okay i'd love to go back Next level. whoa Next right level. whoa i'd love to go back and do it again but i'd do some things differently right i would take some uh, some things a little bit more seriously okay. um when it came to athletics but then also you know schooling too but it, it was a it was a wonderful time Newman High School, right? New Orleans, just a, a small knit community that um, I really enjoyed organized sports. Oh, you're close to the quarterback. Huh? Uh, yeah, we sure did. <laughs> you know, but unfortunately, we never won state, and that is that is a that's a, another one. Of, could I go back and really work a little harder? Maybe right. One that away. Should have held, <laughs> held the points down more. No, I think he would he would say the same thing. Right, the whole time we were there, we never won state. So yeah, like so that means you just don't need to win state to be successful. No, that's true. That's right. But it's still a, let's go back and try it again. <laughs> Thank you to Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge for making this show possible. Nick Pentis is a past guest. We love having him on. Listening to him talk about the culture they have over at Mercedes-Benz of Baton Rouge is really an incredible thing to hear. How they treat not only their employees, but every customer that walks through the door. You are more than just a number to them. They're going to give you that white glove concierge service Every step of the way, they're going to make you feel like family and take what can be a stressful time in people's life, shopping for a car. They're going to make it so enjoyable and so pleasurable. You're going to want to go back there time and time again for every new vehicle. Thank you so very much for Mercedes-Benz of making this show possible. So you all have kind of been in different roles in different areas and in different industries, but have kind of merged into this one company to kind of be partners on this journey together. What are three lessons that y'all have learned along the way throughout your career? Hmm. Well, throughout my career, not always being in recruiting, but I think three kind of general th things. Number one, and Jim might disagree with this, is uh, show up and be on time. Ooh, well, that's um, part of He's up. so punctual, <laughs> you <laughs> hardly notice. I think puts you above like 50% of the population probably. It sure does. Uh, number two, do what you say you're going to do. That probably gets you about 75% there. And number three, show people that you care. And I think if you do those three things, that puts you pretty close to the top of, you know, employees, career-wise, people, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. I'm let you take this one. Oh, man. Okay. Since I didn't know the questions. Yeah, that's <laughs> good. Uh, I would say uh, one thing for sure is to try to leave every job better than you found it. Um, I, you know, one of my jobs, I, I was at a, I was at a great organization as a controller, and then this position came up. I had no plans on leaving that company. I had a nice path from being a controller to a CFO. It had great work-life balance, wonderful organization, but I had to leave because this came up. But I was able to walk into my boss after I'd been there for a year and a month with a list of things we had accomplished to improve the financial processes, the time frame, the accuracy, all these things, and to help him grow his business. And so I think a lot of people, when they put in their notice, they kind of goof off and play around the last couple of weeks. But I encourage everybody, work harder when you're walking out the door because that is integrity. That's where it's really at of, of, of being special and sticking out um, and, and doing the right thing. Um, so I'd say leave every job better than you found it. I would say um, build relationships, focus on that. Um, don't ever look at people as what can you get out of them. Just show care, be genuine, build relationships, and that will help you move forward because there's a lot of talented people out there. But when you care about people and you treat them right, that's something that's memorable and that makes a difference. 
Um, and then the third thing I would say is um, just focus on becoming who you're supposed to be. Um, you know, the, the success will come, the opportunities will come, but if you just work hard, if you try to be who 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 God created you to be and pursue that, that's going to give you opportunities that otherwise you wouldn't have. Um, and and, and it, it all takes care of itself in the end. You know, I, I would always, I had people who would tell me, don't worry about the money, the money's going to come. Don't worry about this, it's going to come. Like, just keep doing what you're supposed to do, and it'll happen. And so I've seen that to be true. I'm not saying it's true for everybody, but I've seen that to be true in most cases. Yeah, I'd probably say that um, having a sense of humor is important, right? Because... You know, you grow up um, being told you got to be perfect here, or do this the right way and that right way. And I have four kids, and having four kids really, you know, puts you in a position to um, deal with stress, of course, number one. But then just you, you got to take a step back, and you have to have a sense of humor because if you don't, you're gonna be pulling your hair out constantly. So just um, looking back and learning, maybe to to take things uh, less serious sometimes. Uh, I've been a ready fire aim guy uh, for a lot of the beginning portion of my career where I've just been eager to get on the phone and make phone calls not knowing what I was doing, right? And I learned a lot from that, uh, but I've also been in position to, to hear customers tell me, hey, listen, you know, what you just said was not accurate, <laughs> right? <laughs> and so just, just, you know, learning to take in the information and um, and and, you know, process it before I, I go out and try to accomplish something, right? So that's just a, a learning moment for me. But then um, letting your effort be louder than your words. I have that up in my office. I think that's important, right? A lot of talk um, daily about what, what I've done. I've done, I, you know, you hear a lot of I in some people and I've learned from a lot of my clients. Like we're looking for people that are we, they wanna hear we in the interview process, right? And so to um, to go about my day trying to think more in team environment rather than, you know, what have I accomplished? I think that would be something that would be important for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. So y'all are from New Orleans, so we'll change this question for y'all a little bit. <laughs> what is something y'all love about Louisiana? Yeah. Obviously the food. Yeah, I think culture-wise, <laughs> just the people here. Um, that southern charm, the family get-togethers, crawfish boils, just uh, people count here, and uh, I think it's it's unique. Yeah, absolutely. I'd like to get on my pro Baton Rouge horse, if I may. Abs yes, come on. Yes. What do you love about Baton Rouge, <laughs> Jim? It. What is uh, your Baton Rouge so fave? So when I came to LSU, I had lived in New Orleans my whole life, and I went to a very small school in Metairie. Um, I graduated 32 kids, and when I came to LSU, I was blown away at how awesome the people were from every part of this state and how incredible Baton Rouge was. And all my friends from Baton Rouge were some of the most well-raised, wholesome, high-quality people, um, and I cherish them to this day. But I was, I mean, you know, I never met, I didn't have any friends growing up from Houghton and from Lake Charles and from, um, you know, Bossier and, and yes. all these places. And I got to get to know these fantastic people from all over the state. So I, I just, you know, I was at LSU. I always joke, say it was the best six and a half years of my life, right? <laughs> um, but I did get a master's, so I'm not that much of okay. a slacker. All right. But, all uh, right. you know, but no, it, it was, it was Over incredible cheer. because, look, 2015 was eight years ago. I mean, it's unbelievable to think about, like, like we're coming up on, you know, for almost four years since COVID happened. I was in Baton Rouge six and a half years, but that was so instrumental in me getting to know people, learning how to just talk with different people and be in different social set settings and situations. And I, I treasure it. It was wonderful. And I really do love my friends from Baton Rouge and, and LSU. So I, I yeah. like Baton Rouge. Good. Glad yeah. to hear it. So I go with passion. I mean, the passion that the, that the people of Louisiana have. I mean, you look at oh, yeah. College World Series. Right, you see um, all the LSU fans on TV. Right, there's a ton of passion there. There's a ton of um, love for the sit, love for the state, and and that's you know whenever you leave Louisiana, you always hear people talk about how nice we are to others, and that's a that's a you know that's another one that that I like to focus on passion and and just um, you know uh, what's the word I want to use uh, you know the niceness. That we have. Good. Good right? word. Yeah. Niceness. Yeah. Yeah. 
the, the generosity, kindness. generosity, the kindness. kindness. Yeah, that's good. You know, yeah. we, can, we keep with the source under the desk that's here. Good. For that's next important. Time. Yeah, I went yeah. to Newman, buddy. Oh, yeah, oh yeah, I know. I know. I know. We all know you went to Newman. <laughs> Hashtag Newman. <laughs> okay, so for the final question, y'all, what can I do to help? Oof. Great well, question. this is good. Uh, hopefully, yeah, yeah. You know, it's a good start. We're gonna get sixty thousand views of this from Sam. Hopefully, tweeting this. That's out right. He's gonna share he this on LinkedIn, and we're um, gonna go viral. Yeah, hopefully, you've enjoyed and learned something from us, and plugging into your network and sending people our way for sure. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, I, I think, and Michael can speak to this too. Um, I think that it's just it's the challenge for us is because people don't always need a recruiter. Whether you're a hiring authority or you're a candidate, you might not have that need. But just to know we're there, that we're the local option, we're Louisiana-based, and that we genuinely don't see people as a transaction, I think that's the most important thing for people to take away from this. So that when you have that friend who says, "Man, I really like to, you know, find a, a change or a new job," oh man, I'm having trouble finding people. Let us know, um, you know, because that's we we we're, we really care and we invest in the community and we love it. And so, um, you know, we support. LSU's, um, you know, Accounting Honor Society, the the construction, CIAC. the CIAC, Construction Management, Louisiana Chemical Association, Louisiana CPA Society. I mean, we, we're literally members of a dozen trade groups, you know, that support the businesses um, around here that we love and the industries we love. So just um, knowing that we're there and, yeah. and, and working with us when the time comes. I mean, the company's been around for over 50 years. And for probably 40, maybe 35 of those years, we've been known as a New Orleans-based company. So if there's definitely one thing you can do to help is to really boost, um, you know, uh, our name, right, within the Baton Rouge community. I mean, most of my customers are in Baton Rouge. So for me, I've been working with Baton Rouge cu customers for over 15 years. But for the company, growing, um, you know, the brand within the Baton Rouge, Lake Charles area, and then onward, uh, would be a great a great start for sure. Yeah, we'll and, and a koozie would help too. Yeah. yeah, we'll give you we'll give you at least one. Yeah, <laughs> this nice. y'all have to share it though on okay. the weekends. We'll you know, you got to rotate the koozie. So, <laughs> but yeah, we'll we'll do what we can, and you know, hopefully we get Grayson on here to kind of spread and promote the word, man. He's, he's yeah. the guy. That's it. So, well, thank y'all so much for coming on the show. I Thanks appreciate you having time. Yes. Appreciate this it. was a great conversation. I love the dynamic. I'm I'm gonna be look. First time you'll have y'all's podcast. I want to just first be the guest. first. I want to be. Uh, look, if you're having guests, I'm in. <laughs> Break the Rogan, seal. You know? after, yeah, of course. After Rogan, of yeah, course. Of course. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. I'm always bound. You know, I always be second to him. <laughs> but nobody else. You know, that's it. That's right. <laughs> so thank y'all so much for coming on the show. Thank you. And, appreciate you know, it. Thank you, everybody else, for watching or listening to the show. I really appreciate it. And another guest do as well. Look, if you are you or someone you know is interested in making a life changing decision and it involves your employment, reach out to these guys. Let them know that the Patty G Show sent you, and you know, just put a little, put a little drop of water in the bucket per se to see if they can find you something if you're interested. There's no need to live your life in a miserable manner for whatever reason it may be. If your employer is one of them, maybe it's time for a change. So give them a reach and kind of just check out what they're all about. So thank you all so much for tuning in, and thank you for the amazing people that bring you this show each and every week. Hear a little bit more about them right now. Thank you to our wonderful sponsor, Lake Men's Health Center with our Lady of the Lake Physicians Group. Guys, I know it's tough to get out and go to the doctor. I know it's challenging to find time in our busy days, but I promise you signing up to be a part of this group with Dr. Curtis Chastain and Dr. Tyler Boudreaux, you won't regret it for several reasons, but most of those being the fact of the time it saves, where you're able to get in on the same day, get that appointment done, and spend that time you need to talk with them about what your health goals and concerns are, as well as ensuring that the financial investments you have, you will be able to live out and see those come to fruition. So if you're an investing guy, you know all about and planning for the future and investing in the future. There's no other more important thing to invest in than your health. Make sure you go check them out, our Lady of the Lake Physicians Group Men's Health Center, and tell them Patty G sent you. McClavey's Limited, a proud sponsor of the Patty G Show, has been serving the Baton Rouge area proudly for 40 plus years. Gentlemen and ladies, if you're shopping for your man, there is no other place in the Baton Rouge area to get your clothing, whether it's game day needs, everyday needs, business attire, formal attire, whatever you want, go over there, see Frank and Ashley. It's a father-daughter duo. They do incredible things in their store. They will outfit you from as simply a shirt that you need for one evening or all the way to a full wardrobe overhaul. 
They're going to take care of you every step of the way, and be sure and let them know that Patty G Show sent you.